tragic endings to otherwise routine flights. Hello, my name's Stuart Matthews. I've been involved in aviation practically all my life. In fact, I even had a private pilot's license before I could drive a car. As far as my aviation experience is concerned, I've designed them, I've built them, I've bought them, I've flown them, I've sold them, I've operated them, and yes, I've even crashed them. Over the years, I've seen a lot of changes in aviation, but unfortunately, one thing hasn't changed. Planes are still crashing into the ground in spite of incredible advances in technology, safety devices, equipment, training, weather forecasting, as well as air traffic control. In any aircraft accident, loss of life is particularly devastating. The difference between the type of accidents that we will be discussing in this video and others is that these occurred in situations where the flight crew firmly believed that they had the aircraft well under control. As these types of accidents have been investigated over the years, the term controlled flight into terrain, CFIT, has evolved. In most cases, CFIT accidents occur when reality and the flight crew's assessment of their situation are grossly in error. More specifically, CFIT defines a situation when an aircraft is flown into terrain, either land or water, with no prior awareness on the part of the crew of impending disaster. Caused primarily by a lack of lateral or vertical situational awareness, many CFIT accidents could be avoided through improved planning, understanding, and training. This program is part of a comprehensive worldwide industry effort led by the Flight Safety Foundation to help eliminate the CFIT problem. In addition to this video, the Flight Safety Foundation has produced and distributed worldwide our CFIT checklist. This valuable tool helps assess the degree of CFIT threat for a given situation by weighing operational risk versus risk reduction factors such as flight crew training and aircraft equipment. What follows is the examination of the problem, including the analysis of three CFIT accidents. We'll conclude by looking at the types of preventative measures that can help air crews from compromising their situational awareness and causing a tragic accident. Since 1958, more than 8,300 people have become CFIT statistics. Although there has been a general decline in the frequency of CFIT accidents over the past 20 years, CFIT is still the number one killer of passengers and crew aboard commercial transport aircraft. Your risk of being involved in a CFIT accident is dependent on a number of factors, including such things as equipment, training, environment, and type of operation. Although the majority of CFIT fatalities occur on large commercial aircraft, the largest number of CFIT accidents involve small turboprop and jet aircraft. In the smaller aircraft category, air taxi operations have the worst CFIT accident record, accounting for over 60% of the total. Corporate aircraft are averaging about seven CFIT accidents worldwide per year, which is slightly less than the rate for air taxi operations. In the United States alone, business turboprop aircraft are currently averaging one CFIT accident per month. Other than the priceless cost in human life and suffering, CFIT accidents over a recent five-year period accounted for nearly one billion dollars in losses in commercial jet transportation alone. Over the years, improved technology has helped to stem the tide, particularly in large commercial transports. Since the world's airlines began equipping with Ground Proximity Warning Systems, or GPWS, in 1974, CFIT accidents have been reduced significantly. However, for commuter, regional, air taxi, corporate, and business aircraft operators, the trend has not been as good. Around the globe, for example, we lose approximately 25 aircraft per year to CFIT accidents. Air taxi aircraft are involved in about half this number. No matter what type of aircraft you fly, your CFIT risk increases dramatically during the approach phase. And contrary to what many pilots may believe, 
CFIT accidents on approach don't normally occur because the pilots stray off the approach course into surrounding terrain. Rather, most pilots were right on course, but didn't manage their descent properly. Furthermore, one half of all CFIT accidents occur on instrument approaches that incorporate multiple DME step-down fixes. These types of approaches increase the potential for error, even among experienced pilots. For example, in 1992, the 13,000-hour captain of an Airbus A300 descended early and flew into the side of a ridge while on this approach to Kathmandu, Nepal. Although statistical data help document the fact that we have a problem, they do little in the way of prevention. As difficult as it may be to relive the last moments prior to disaster, the process can be a valuable tool in accident prevention. With that in mind, we'll examine three cases that exemplify some of the most prevalent problems associated with CFIT. The first case we'll look at is a classic CFIT accident in mountainous terrain in poor weather. The facts in this accident are from the United States Official Aviation Accident Investigation Agency, the National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB. Just after 8 a.m. on December 11, 1991, a beach jet carrying seven passengers and two crew members landed at the Richard B. Russell Airport near Rome, Georgia. The aircraft was owned and operated by a chain of supermarkets and related stores based in Birmingham, Alabama. The passengers were on an annual Christmas tour of company facilities. During the approximately one hour that it took for the passengers to complete their business in Rome, the pilots filed an IFR flight plan with a stopover in Huntsville, en route to Birmingham. The estimated time of departure was filed as 9.15 in the morning. Around 9.25, the passengers who were reportedly pushing to maintain their schedule arrived at the airport. Eight minutes later, the beach jet taxied for takeoff. Since requesting and waiting for an IFR departure clearance could have resulted in a delay of up to 30 minutes, the captain apparently decided to expedite matters. With a ceiling of 1,000 feet and visibility of 10 miles, the captain initiated a VFR departure with the intention of picking up an IFR clearance en route. 13 seconds after takeoff, the captain contacted Atlanta Center, informing them that he had just departed Rome VFR and was looking for a clearance to Huntsville. ATC assigned the aircraft a transponder code with instructions to maintain VFR. A traffic advisory for aircraft on approach to Rome was also issued. Two minutes later, Atlanta Center, which due to line of sight limitations, did not have radar contact with the aircraft, asked the crew to state their altitude. The crew informed ATC that they were at 1300 feet VFR, just southwest of Rome Airport. Over the next minute, the captain and first officer discussed their proximity to rising terrain and other aircraft on approach to Rome. 30 seconds later, and nearly four minutes after takeoff, the beach jet slammed into the south side of Mount Lavender during level flight at an altitude of 1,580 feet, killing all nine people on board. How could two pilots, with combined flight experience of over 19,000 hours, who knew they were flying in the vicinity of terrain rising above their flight level, still end up a CFIT statistic. A good place to start the search for answers is the CFIT checklist. If everything went perfectly, the crew was still operating without ATC radar coverage, in mountainous terrain, and out of an airport with no published IFR departure. Matters were complicated further by the captain's decision to initiate visual flight into such an environment with low ceilings. Although the pilots knew they were in an area of rapidly rising terrain, the lowest cloud layer would have obscured the tops of the nearby terrain, making it difficult for the crew to pinpoint their location. During the last minute of flight, the crew could not agree on which way to turn to avoid the terrain and weather. Instead, they faithfully continued straight ahead until it was too late. 
The NTSB cited the crew's failure to maintain situational awareness in the marginal VFR flight environment as the probable cause of the accident. However, other than advising against scud running, the board didn't offer a well-defined solution that could eliminate future accidents of this type. What then can be done? Initially, Crews and operators should be alerted when they are operating in an environment of heightened CFIT risk. As highlighted in the CFIT checklist, this awareness can be developed through an examination of the proposed flight profile and characteristics such as ATC capabilities, aircraft equipment, terrain, and weather. Next, policies and procedures should be examined to ensure that they foster a safe, coordinated, and consistent flight operation. Additionally, training programs should be established that promote continued CFIT awareness, risk recognition, and corrective action. It's also important that any program of this sort is supported by open channels of communication to address and resolve procedural diversions as well as crew and management conflict. While a comprehensive CFIT awareness program can quickly improve situational awareness, Equipping aircraft with improved avionics represents another source of risk reduction. Although advanced technology may be a long-term solution for some operators, its value is obvious. For example, let's take a look at how an installed GPWS might have altered the outcome of the flight from Rome, Georgia. This recreation depicts the last 20 seconds before impact. Had a GPWS been installed, a warning would have sounded about 12 seconds prior to impact. Terrain! Terrain! Pull up! Pull up! Pull up! The NTSB up, determined up, that this warning up, should have provided up, adequate time for the pilots up, to take up, evasive action. Pull up, pull up. Thus, despite the compromising position in which the crew placed the aircraft and passengers, an installed GPWS acting as the last line of defense may have saved the aircraft, passengers, and crew. However, it's important to emphasize that although modern technology may have helped prevent this accident, the lack of an installed GPWS didn't cause the aircraft to fly into the side of Mount Lavender. GPWS is a defensive instrument only. That is, if you get to the point where the GPWS warning activates, you have already dug yourself a very large hole that may still be impossible to climb out of. Flight crew awareness and vigilance are the primary tools that should be used to avoid CFIT.